We began about 20 minutes late, so I'm going to ask the organizers for at least five additional minutes. Uh, and what I'd like to do is actually open the floor first to all of you because you've been sitting quite patiently through a number of different presentations. Um, let's take a first round of comments and questions, and if we have time, we'll go through, we'll go through two rounds uh, with the panelists. So any questions or comments from the floor? I just want to ask Kevin to talk a little bit about the sustainable systems of finance and uh, just elaborate a bit more on, on that part of the presentation. I'm sorry, Jamie, to talk about the sustainable what? I, I couldn't quite hear you. Um, the, the sources of money. Ah, yeah, yeah. So um, the, the most uh, elaborated version of financing for antibiotic delinkage is found in the O'Neill report, the AMR commission. Um, jointly sponsored by the Prime Minister of, uh, of the United Kingdom and uh, by Wellcome Trust. Uh, there were a couple components. One was called the pay or play, which I think uh, qualifies as the, the one that the companies like the least, all right? And the pay or play says that um, without antibiotics, uh, good luck selling oncology drugs or doing a lot of other things. Uh, so that uh, you know, a lot of the industry has left antibiotics a few have stayed, Glaxo and Pfizer to, to an extent, and a couple of others, uh, AstraZeneca. Uh, but the ones who have left would have to pay their fair share. And the ones who've stayed you know, would get credit for what they're investing. So the pay or play says that the rest of the industry is free riding on the few that are still doing antibiotic R&D they should pay. Uh, a second idea. Um, which is uh, also described, I believe, in the, in the O'Neill materials and is also being discussed, uh, but is not decided within Drive AB, is some sort of a, of a tax or user fee, uh, perhaps on just on animal or agricultural use of antibiotics. So for example, um, a group of us have modeled a $25 per kilogram tax on bulk API antibiotics uh, would raise uh, several hundred million dollars a year. And it wouldn't drive out, it wouldn't eliminate uh, low value use of antibiotics in the agricultural sector, but would it make it less economic. And so farmers that are using it as a feed additive with, with a low economic value uh, would be incentivized to stop doing that. And uh, the high value uses that, uh, to a sick cow would still be quite economical and that would raise money as well. Um, the other ideas are straight out of general fiscal uh, you know, budgets, you know, out of health budgets in Europe. And the final idea is, is the, for the U.S. government on the U.S. side uh, to sell uh, patent vouchers, which would then be used to fund antibiotic innovation. I think those are the four that are being discussed, and I'm sure there's others, but I don't want to take up too much time. Let me take the moderator's prerogative to note that there are actually some interesting commonalities between the debates around AMR and the potential creation of some kind of global R&D fund to which uh, the UK government and the Chinese government have already announced a commitment of funds. At the same time, there's been a lot of discussion around the potential creation of a fund called CEPI for uh, investment into R&D for outbreaks and, and diseases of epidemic potential. I think one of the questions that has come up as, um, and excuse me, the third one, which is of course uh, the creation of a global R&D fund at the tropical, the, the TDR, which has a very long name, Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases. Um, based at WHO. Uh, so after many years of many people pushing for the creation of global R&D funds, primarily financed with public money, there are suddenly three that are very much on the table and part of a very live debate. But one of the questions that we've not yet heard a lot of discussion around is what principles should drive um, the way those funds are invested? And can we take some of the lessons from these experiments in innovation and access over the past uh, 10 to 15 years to inform the way that money is deployed? Um, so let me actually first throw this question to Tom, since you're uh, looking at, at outbreak-related R&D and, and what kind of suggestions would you make to those who are putting together CEPI, for example? Um, and that may also include, by the way, governments from the north and south uh, in the same way that the AMR debate has, has spurred uh, potential contributions from governments across the income level. Great. Uh, great question. Um, a funny thing about the debate over, and there are not many funny things about the debate over the Zika emergency uh, funding program, um, the politics of which mystify me. But the one thing that people do seem to agree on is that uh, funding for R&D. 
the House of Representatives uh, came forward. The president, as I think most people perhaps know, uh, requested $2 billion in emergency and appropriation for emergency funding for Zika. The House of Representatives came up with uh, $612 million, almost all of that for R&D. Uh, so while that's not an acceptable uh, response to the Zika outbreak, I do think it suggests there is some political consensus around support for R&D, which hopefully will be a starting point for addressing the other needs that have to happen um, to respond to, to, that, uh, to that outbreak. Uh, so in terms of funding, ideally what you would like to see is instead of serial emergency appropriations of funding, uh, which yeah. is what we've seen so far and leads to this kind of political conflict, clearly unsustainable, creates a lack of predictability, which is important both for the R&D side, but quite frankly, for a lot of the downstream response also. Um, people, people need to know their support, is you'd like to see this galvanize uh, the creation of a fund um, of, of some kind that Surya, Surya mentioned. There have been other programs, I mentioned two very briefly because I, I went too long on my presentation at the end in terms of looking at access prin principles that can drive what, uh, how those funds might work. Um, what they've traditionally involved is some uh, acknowledgement that um, uh, the entities, the commercial entities that come into the space or even um, non-commercial entities into the space can keep their existing IP uh, to their project IP, uh, but that uh, the milestones being set, uh, the licensing being set, the eventual pricing that emerges out of this favors access in low and middle income countries and a commitment to do that. Um, and that is a condition of either receiving the grant or the participation in the fund. I think that's sensible um, in this space. I think what will be interesting to me, I'm a little less concerned about how we navigate the, the R and the upstream side. I think there are a lot of interesting models of doing that. You've heard some from Kevin. There's, a, I mean, hundreds of law review articles and economic papers on different innovation models at this point. Um, what I do think is a real problem is the manufacturing access, what happens in the downstream. Um, because I do think there is a tremendous risk uh, in the midst of a quite serious outbreak. And as I mentioned, Ebola at the end of the day is a very hard disease to catch. Um, uh, Zika is, has had a terrible impact, but you could easily see something much worse. And I think the temptation for governments to nationalize their manufacturing capacity is real and monopolize. And what ends up happening in low and middle income countries in that setting is problematic. Uh, people will remember the pandemic um, influenza preparedness framework that emerged from this uh, Indonesia concern. That only extends to pandemic influenza. It doesn't extend to seasonal influenza. It doesn't extend to other diseases. And even in that context where you had a country holding up the whole process with holding samples, uh, it didn't include advanced purchase agreements. Uh, the political consensus that you have out there for commitments to access is, is really uh, limited under those circumstances, and I don't see progress being made unless you see more distributed manufacturing, um, at least regionally. Any other questions and comments? Yes, we have one. Please. Uh, thanks. Tom, I actually had a question um, related to that because, um, you, you know, on the one hand, I take your point about having a manufacturing base uh, at the ready uh, in the case of um, uh, pandemic outbreak. But on the other hand, um, I think it was noted earlier this morning, this is an industry that is characterized by pretty large scale economies of manufacturing. And I wonder if, if, that, if that sort of approach of, 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 of uh, you know, wanting to have um, or trying to have a, a, a multiplicity of manufacturing centers around the world, and particularly in places that, that don't have a very large manufacturing or technical base isn't going to build a lot of more cost into the system, cost and inefficiency into the system itself. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, it's a real concern. I mean, I will say it is the way in general global health is going. Um, uh, increasingly, funders, you know, I was at the, the, the Gates Foundation every year holds these product development forums, and it's uh, filled with entities that come and talk about how these products will be developed and how they'll be delivered. And the Chinese presence was just massive 
at these. I mean, I think there is a increasing interest in emerging countries to have a manufacturing base and global health is one way to develop that. That, in my view, is really the only sustainable way, um, long-term way to address uh, neglected diseases is if you see a greater set of actors in the space. There are some real systemic concerns that need to be managed, for sure. Uh, manufacturing controls have not always been great um, in this context, and I think people need to talk about painful things to acknowledge. In global health conversations, we need to acknowledge there have been real problems. Uh, there's also not a lot of support for global um, uh, post-market safety monitoring at all. Um, the budgets for these countries or for these manufacturers is tiny in that space. So there needs to be support extended. But particularly in these contexts, you see a pandemic influenza that even looks half of what you saw in 1918. If there's not more distributed manufacturing, first of all, you can't respond to it. But secondly, there's just not a lot of incentive for other countries to participate if the manufacturing is going to be overwhelmingly in high-income countries. OK, thanks. We have uh, Julia in the back and then push on. Um, Tom, so this is continuing on the distributed manufacturing question. I think it's a, it's a very serious um, risk in many ways, especially for more complex manufacturing. I mean, I think for oral solids and small molecules, we are at a stage where we can do a lot more distributed manufacturing. Uh, one company in particular has pods, which we're seeing a lot of success out of. So, so those, those, for small molecules, I think we can address it through distributed manufacturing. But for more complex things, the challenge is that if in North America and Europe, we don't have political buy-in for sharing product across, and if Europe says we want our own manufacturing and we in North America want our own, then that sets an example where every country says, oh, we want to have our own manufacturing for these pandemic products. And that's not sustainable from a cost standpoint. That's not sustainable from a quality standpoint. Right. So I think something needs to happen in the OECD club for this to trickle down and translate into how this will be viewed by industry ministers and industrial policy and health intersections in developing countries. Yeah. And I, at least I haven't seen much of that happen. No, and clearly you're not going to have a manufacturing base in every country. Um, but you can, one can imagine an arrangement where for funding support of a manufacturing capacity base, you need to enter into advanced purchasing agreements or the types of commitments people weren't willing to enter into in the pandemic uh, influenza preparedness framework negotiations if there is support from that. So you can imagine that. The other thing I would, you would like to see is some synergies between the broader research development happening in global health, which is investing in manufacturing these places. So I mentioned Manafrabac in my presentation. It is the first novel vaccine registered by emerging country manufacturer. They are now doing more of that. And that, I think, there's a reason why these, these governments, these countries are engaged in these activities, but I think it's a good thing um, in terms of system. People talk a lot about resilience in global health. This is resilience. Um, it's important. Okay, uh, last com uh, we'll, okay, we'll take so two last comments, and then we're going partly to... Partly a um, follow-up, and partly this is, um, actually, this is for Jamie. Um, in following up, so your new business model and your new set-aside business, um, how do you explain or, or um, uh, design the business model internally that that makes sense? And I was just about to ask, so will that actually involve doing manufacturing more of your global projects across different regions than you've been doing in the past? In other words, how will it change things and why is it of benefit to internally enough that they were willing to create this. So in the interest of time, let's get um, the uh, last two questions and then we'll go across the panel, yeah. Thanks, um, so I just wanted to think about the, um, the outbreak preparedness and you know, where the pandemic influenza uh, uh, framework comes in and where it doesn't. For, for us at MSF, and here I, I can speak <laughs> for MSF and not in my personal capacity, uh, it starts very early on with uh, just data sharing and specimen sharing, uh, which frequently comes up in, uh, I would say, um, a slightly imperialistic way where we try and bash the heads of Brazil for not sharing specimens or bash Indonesia's heads for not sharing specimens. But they have very real fears because, in fact, these will come back. And now in the US, you can't necessarily 
patent the virus itself, but back in the day you could, and they found out that that was happening, and so they were reasonably upset knowing that they wouldn't get any access unless they uh, really raised the issue. Um, in the Ebola outbreak, the, uh, the specimens off the country, many uh, to CDC labs, uh, which are definitely doing some really fantastic work, but really with no uh, true accountability to anybody. And uh, we've been disappointed to see um, how the CDC uh, has not been more forthcoming and how they're using the specimens uh, and uh, agreeing to use these very precious few specimens according to agreed global research priorities. And so what we're working on at MSF is thinking about the access issues from a very early stage to have uh, provisions attached to use of the data to transfer of any specimens that originate from MSF so that uh, we ha can create standards for a broader uh, outbreak preparedness along with WHO, and this is where the blueprint comes in that they've uh, introduced at the last World Health Assembly, so that we can have a very um, expansive view thinking about this from the very beginning because, um, you know, often uh, I think we take the attitude that uh, uh, that's, that's fairly paternalistic to um, developing country needs, and I think that those need to be truly addressed um, to make sure that they are partners with us. Um, and just with regard to, um, you know, the ability of developing countries to manufacture, um, folks like Bob Cook Deegan and others have done really in-depth looks at expanding ability to manufacture vaccines and biologics uh, in developing countries. And uh, I think that there's actually a lot of capabilities out there and that we shouldn't just sit here at Harvard and poo-poo uh, what can happen in the rest of the world. So I think that may have been a question for, for okay. Uh, let, me, let me pose one last question and then we'll start with Jamie and go down the panel and, and have some very, very rapid closing remarks, which is these new funds that I was just mentioning may be on the order of 100 million per year to $2 billion per year, so they are sizable. If you were in control of these funds, what big out of the box idea, what innovative radical new practice would you want to put in place with this money? Or you can choose to answer a question that was posed to you uh, more directly. So I'll start with, with Jamie and then we'll come down. Okay, well I'll answer the question that was posed. So I, I'm, I think the impetus for pulling together this business model innovation, this new um, now highly connected one team around global public health was driven in part by the fact that we simply weren't being as effective as we could be against uh, certain major global health challenges in which we've been heavily invested. So for example, we've, uh, we've given more than $100 million in philanthropic funding to support uh, the fight against HIV AIDS over the last 10 years, and yet we see in adolescent populations, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, rising rates of incidence and, and feeling ill-equipped to, to manage that. We uh, looked inside our company and said, wait a second, we have within our consumer organization a clean and clear portfolio and other products specifically geared toward adolescent consumers with treasure troves of knowledge about behavior change and influence of you know, specific to adolescent girls and yet here we we've given money to the fight through philanthropic funds but we haven't tapped into our business resources those assets that knowledge that expertise and how can we create better connectivity? For context, about nine years ago when we started an access and affordability initiative within our pharmaceutical sector, there were four people dedicated to it part-time. And we think about the, you know, the breadth of the issues and the persistent issues that we've addressed today, four people part-time for a global commercial strategy organization that just doesn't work. And that was separate from our HIV team working on um, uh, providing access for second and third line treatments through global access partnerships and voluntary licensing program, which was separate from strategic philanthropy, separate from our government affairs organization, and so on and so forth. And uh, it, it's really incumbent upon us as, as companies to look within are under, underneath our own hood and say, how can we bring more and how can we organize better? And we organize better through the leadership of a st global strategic design office, which is a design, which is about design thinking, human-centered design. And as we began to uh, pull together what we called grand challenges workshops in HIV, TB, and other areas of concern, we placed real patient stories at the center and then we brought leaders from across our sectors to bring strategies based on their own knowledge and expertise and resources. And, and it unveiled for us all of the potential and that in of itself was impetus for this new business model innovation, which we would characterize, I think, in some sense, 
to use common parlance as a shared value type of model. Again, we've just launched it. We're looking to evolve it. But uh, but you know, thinking about it, other pieces of the business that haven't been connected into this work, our, our manufacturing lines, for example, are, are an important piece of that fold. And we've now connected our vaccine work and our pandemic readiness work and our global health security work all together. You'll recall in the, in, in the Ebola fight where there was this absence of organization internally at J&J and especially externally, we made some emergency pivots to make available manufacturing lines. We realized that we need to be better organized in order to help the external world be better organized. And so that's, uh, that's part of our purpose and we hope you'll help us with it. Very briefly. So, Ethan, I'm really surprised about your comment about Harvard because I have to say Boston excels at paternalistic ideas for the other people around the world. The whole city, we're good at this. Um, you know, we, we can make fun of other countries saying that, you know, why do you want uh, your own plant? Don't you know there's a good one in, in, in New Jersey and another one in Paris? Uh, but for the United States, um, you know, we spent hundreds of millions of dollars through BARDA uh, because we didn't like the fact that the only vaccine plant of a certain type was located in France. And so we have a we built it here, you know, using U.S. government funds to have a second source within the territory of the United States of America, which could be surrounded by our army. You know, it was a biosecurity decision by the United States. And so we should not easily dismiss the fact that other countries have similar concerns. We put real money on the table. What I would do with with four billion dollars, I upped the number, is uh, <laughs> is for antibiotics. If we had the global market is 40 billion. If we spent 10% of that, 4 billion, uh, we could delink the entire market and transform the way that the whole system works from top to bottom. And I think that's useful for antibiotics, of course. I also think that it would be a test uh, in a discrete drug class as to whether delinkage was helpful or whether it was actually not helpful. And we actually need to test this idea instead of just continuing to talk about it. Great. Um... Well, I'm tempted to build off Kevin's comment and use my one wish to ask for three more wishes and have and have more uh, funding in this space because I, I do think two million two billion is too little for the size of the problem. But leaving aside the the comments I uh, made in there about distributed uh, or coordinated innovation occurring around vaccine vaccine platform technologies, which you do want to see in, in the ways that we presented in that paper, one thing that I didn't get much of a chance to talk about. In, uh, but Colleen mentioned was the issue of regional or joint approaches to regulatory pathways. And I think using this, that money and this opportunity to approach those uh, in advance uh, as a way of pooling capacity, creating more definition, ideally also expediting, um, uh, it's not a lot of money. Uh, there's literally nobody in this space funding uh, regulatory systems. And one of the issues about the focus on global health security, of course, as was mentioned by Surrey at the outset, this is by no means the only big global health problem we have right now. Um, and uh, investing in these kinds of systems can have uh, a, a, multiple, a multiple purpose to it. I would love to see more of that. Okay. And with that, let's break for coffee. Thank you very much. <laughs>